welcome to this Beck Connections in Organisational Psychology. We're delighted to welcome Professor Al McMadal, who's going to be talking to us about the future of work. We've obviously been going through so many changes over the last um, couple of months, and it will be really exciting to hear um, her perception of, of what's been going on in organisations, but also what we can draw from the research to help us understand um, how to make sense of it and how to make informed decisions. So Professor um, Almuth McDowell has been Head of Department at the um, Department of Organisational Psychology here at Birkbeck and has a wealth of research that has been looking at work-life balance and always on cultures um, to try and understand how we can really make people's working lives better. So I'm delighted that you're here to share your research with us today. So as a starting point, you've been working with lots of organisations to help them think and, and process what's been going on. Um, could you share some of your thoughts around how the world of work is changing at the moment? Of course, Jo. So thank you for the kind introduction. Um, for the last, well, nearly three months it will be, of course, we've been living in a giant experiment. Um, three years ago, when my great uh, friend and collaborator, Professor Kinman, and I set out to do our research on the always on culture from the organization angle, one of the questions that we asked people was, do you think that organizations are actually prepared for more digital ways of working? And the majority of people said, no, absolutely not. And here we are. We now all have to work digitally. We all, um, with rare exceptions, now have to work from home, particularly us in professional stroke knowledge uh, organizations, where we're having to manage teams virtually. We have to conduct all of our work digitally, and we had to manage very rapid organizational change. Now, what we do know is that these ways of working are gonna be with us certainly for a transition period and perhaps forever. So some really big organizations such as Facebook have already announced that they would like to keep home working as a sort of default way of operating. But I also know from other organizations that I've worked with that people can't wait to go back to the office because they're just really hungry for human connection. So the most profound change has that has been that we are now all working digitally in a virtual world, which means that also we have to manage teams and people virtually. And having worked with a whole range of organizations, both private, public sector, large and small, one of the really difficult things for people is how do I actually check in with people, right? If somebody is really quiet, they haven't spoken up in team meetings for the last two or three weeks, how do I know that they're actually okay? Particularly, of course, in the context of this pandemic where schools are closed as well. So some people, like myself, I'm relatively lucky, we bought our house years ago. So we've got a study that I share with my husband, even though he's a bit too, too loud on the telephone, but okay, I can live with that, I'm still privileged. But there are some people who are working at home, they've got little toddlers running around their legs and actually, that is a pretty, pretty stressful set of circumstances. Not, so not only do we have to work virtually, we're also working virtually in a way where really we didn't have the right setup from the word go because what the research shows us that you can make digital and virtual working work much better if you agree expectations and in a sense it's a really simple set of principles right from the outset. So. How do we want to work with each other? What actually are our points of engagement? How do we distribute work in teams? How do we make sure that people are checking in on each other? How do I actually know that a job has been done and that a job has been done well? And also, let's make no mistakes. Businesses have to survive, right? And we all have to come out of this crisis. This means that performance has to be managed. Now, that is a particularly tough thing to do at the moment because we know that people are vulnerable. And by the way, it's really important in your teams, in your organizations to acknowledge that this is an exceptional situation where we are exercising maximum flexibility, but jobs still have to be done. So what if somebody is not performing, not delivering? How do you actually have those more, more difficult conversations 
uh, under the current circumstances. So these are some of the issues that people are really concerned with. Plus, of course, how do we manage transitions, particularly given that we don't really know what the transition might actually look like. Absolutely. There's a whole melting pot, aren't there, of different, yeah. different issues going on and such diversity of experiences for people within the same team even. So very difficult for line managers to, to manage. I was wondering from your work um, that was focusing on the, all in, um, the always on culture, were there some very specific findings that could help us better manage some of those issues, particularly our boundaries? Yeah, so communication is absolutely key uh, because we know that from our research that one of the things that can improve through virtual ways of working is communication, but also one of the things that is most likely to get worse through um, virtual working is also communication. So then the question really is, how do you communicate? And the same rule applies as it would apply to managing organizational change more broadly. And really one of the simplest rules is communicate, communicate, communicate. You have to think, say things once and if they're important, say them again. And then if they're really important, say them a third time. And so reaffirm core messages. That's really important to make sure that you bring everybody on board because don't take it as read that everybody will actually read your emails the first time round. Very often they don't. So you might need to find another way of cascading communication. So as a line manager, I'm very well aware of this. Some people will listen to me, but some people won't. They might be more likely to listen to somebody who is closer to them. So think about how you can actually get key messages through to your own team and then make sure that people are sharing these messages. It's also a real infrastructure issue when we're working virtually is, well, where do we actually you know, put messages, documents, so that there is a legacy for everybody, uh, making sure that key information, key documentation is shared. And when you're managing virtually and you don't have clear responsibilities for instance for who is responsible for simple things such as where do you lock things who is responsible for version control particularly for those of us who are also doing client facing work the last thing you want to do right now is to send a, a client brief out that is not the most recent version so you need to be really really clear about expectations and responsibilities and make sure that these are very very transparent and shared across teams mm, now i can see that um, that that is a huge challenge for people to get right isn't it i was really interested with the idea of um keeping up the communication in an informal way as well. I think certainly from the mental health research that, that we've been doing, is that social re that social connection is really vital. But actually, you can land some really great messages when you're having informal conversations as well. Yes, absolutely. And lots of organisations are doing really helpful things around that, such as you know having virtual coffee break coffee breaks every day some of them have been organizing pub quizzes or informal get-togethers in the evening really lots of things to sort of facilitate that social glue that binds people together but i think the key thing here is not to take it too far and to do something that actually meets people's needs because in some of the organizations i've been working with they've said actually it's gone too far now because I spend so much of my time just looking at the screen and actually make no mistakes. Online meetings are much harder on you than being physically in the room with other people because it's that much harder to read those little non-verbal signs. Very often you have to concentrate much more because the pace is greater. And, you know, I've been there, got the T-shirt, bought the book when I've had five hour long online meetings back to back. 
I'm knackered afterwards. And actually, can I actually remember what was said in each of the meetings? No, I can't. So yes, you're absolutely right that informal communication can be really, really powerful. But just as a word of warning, it needs to be something that people want and have signed up to so that you don't inadvertently create those extra opportunities into yet another demand that glues people to their screen even more than they've been glued to the screen beforehand. Uh, because also, you know, we know that it's so important to, to take breaks away from the screen as well. So I guess that's a note of caution that I might add to that. Absolutely. And I think now is a really good time to revisit how we've been working and, and what protocols and norms we put in now that we know that we're likely to be in this situation for like likely a couple of months longer um it really is important that as individuals as teams we really do connect with those and um try and bed out what's going to work for us um, i think one of the other things that i don't know if that this came out in your research before but how it's a constant need to re-evaluate and um think accept that things might change over time so um Certainly over the last couple of months, I've found very different strategies to getting my work done. Sometimes it's working in the morning, sometimes it's working piecemeal throughout the day. Um, how do you find that people manage that when they're working in, in remote locations? It's a really good question. I think one of the questions that is a, is a heart of this is whose responsibility actually is it? to manage remote ways of working. So on balance, what people told us in our research was that actually overall, they thought it as more of an individual responsibility than an organizational or line management responsibility. And I think that's a potential trap not to fall into because yes, all of us have individual responsibility because at the end of the day, um, to take down time and to make sure that we actually recover and recuperate and have time away from the screen and from these devices. That's, of course, you know, part of that is our responsibility. But in terms of agreeing at a group level, at an organization, at a team level, actually, how do we want to work with each other? Actually, that is a joint responsibility. And you can't absolve people from that. And absolutely one of the key issues here and then one of the difficulties as well, since, sorry, government uh, guidance has been as clear as mud in this regard, is actually continuously re-evaluating re whether things are still appropriate and you know whether we have agreed the right mechanisms for how we want to work with each other. And you're absolutely right, you know, for some of us, it actually might mean very individual adjustments. Um, also, we don't yet know when schools are going to go back yet, you know, some of us might have more breathing space, but some of us might not. So taking into account these individual circumstances, but also reviewing collectively, actually, are our ways of working still still functional so you know some businesses of course are now already managing the transition to perhaps you know in, in a staged way transitioning back to an office environment but simply managing that transition that takes skill and time and effort that people might then not have available for other tasks so is there somebody else then in the team who could then perhaps take on some of the other tasks that they might then be fulfilling. So actually some of it is about really basic processes in terms of workload allocation and making sure that nobody is overloaded and there is a fair sharing of duties, which actually is, is jolly difficult to do when you're not ever seeing people and you don't get these you know, informal signals when, when, you know, you look at somebody in the corridor and you think, actually, are they okay? You know, they look a bit frazzled around the edges. Um, it's much harder to have those informal opportunities, perhaps for one-to-one -one conversations that you were alluding to earlier. Um, they remain very important, but also it's really important to have that collective responsibility at the team and organizational level, rather than thinking, actually, Joe, you know, Almut, it's your responsibility to sort it all out. No, 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 we have to do it all together. Absolutely. I think that's so important. And I really um, 
I really noticed that that almost heavy load of a, a line manager having to to try and navigate that. And so just before we close, are there any um, particular tips for line managers um, that you would identify from the research that might lend themselves to the current situation? I think it's really helpful to draw ourselves back to that notion this is a collective responsibility. And one of the things that is most stressful to people is when expectations are implicit and not explicit. So don't ever think you're you're too explicit in the communication that you give to people and might be really simple things when you have a team meeting that somebody and it's actually better it's if it's not always you is then responsible for sharing action points making it very very clear who is responsible for what in terms of agreeing tasks also be very clear about the time frame and about priorities so what is a must and what is a possible where actually if people don't get it done then <laughs> the world <laughs> won't come crashing down around us so it's really about clarity about emphasizing the joint responsibility and bringing people with you the other thing that research not just ours overall is showing particularly in times of crisis it's really important to take an individual approach when you think that people might be struggling and don't be shy of approaching people when either you see signs in them that they might be stressed or struggling or indeed when performance is really nose diving because again there could be a well-being issue behind this so i think that would be third thing would be don't be shy about having difficult conversations absolutely thank you ever so much i think those are really powerful messages um, if you want to learn more about the research, there's um, references following, but also do look on our department site because we have various information there and we hope that you join the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome.